I'm gonna pray for all the men. And yeah. then everyone watching, not just the men, everyone watching. Amen. We've been hearing messages yeah. on, on keeping ourselves on the, the fire on the altar. Yes. And I want to believe for the spirit of wisdom. Yeah. So that we're just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Amen. Wisdom to actually take the principles that have been yeah. taught. And mm -hmm. I, I, that is still going to be taught today. And mm -hmm. leave them out. Mm -hmm. Because that's what really matters. Okay? Amen. So Heavenly Amen. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. For your word that has been coming for today. We thank yes, you Lord. for the ministers that have given us counsel. And Father God, we acknowledge the presence of your spirit that dwells within us, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel. We, your word says, as many as are led by the spirit, are the sons of God. Father, we call for the influence and leading of your spirit. We call for your spirit to rise up within us, to be directed to our spirit and illumination to our minds. We pray for insight and counsel of the ability to think together and to execute the vision that you are revealing to our hearts right now. Father, God, I pray for everyone. Let us be, let our hearts be set up late in the midst of us. Let us be set up in the midst Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. 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 It's such a great time to be here. Amen. Again, too. And also to share with everyone. Okay, so I'm just going to go straight into uh, the message. Um, let's open our Bible to the book of Proverbs chapter 4. I'm going to read from verse 20 to 23. Proverbs 4, 20 to 23. Now, we've been talking about fire on the altar, and I think it's clear to every one of us that the fire, the, sorry, the altar is actually in our hearts. The, the altar of God is in our hearts. In the Old Testament, there was the tabernacle, the temple, and there was fire that was being offered on the altar, like Pastor Shepherd mentioned, and the fire was never meant to go out. In the New Testament, the Bible says we present our bodies to God a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. The Bible says our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we are actually God's temple our hearts are the altar. Now, the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 20 to 23, gives us a very important instruction about our hearts. So I'm going to read from verse 20 of Proverbs, chapter 4. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, my son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear to my saints. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of of thine heart. We mentioned that the heart is the altar. Keep the word of God in the midst of your heart. Verse 22, for they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Now verse 23 gives a very important instruction. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of your heart are the issues of life. If you compare that in several translations, some translations will let you realize that whatever goes on in your heart affects your life. Whatever goes on in your heart, your, your heart is out of your heart flows the issues of life. Your heart impacts your life. So whatever we allow in our hearts, which is the altar of God, impacts our life. So now, because our heart affects our life, it is our job to make sure that if we want to walk in the direction of God's will, if we want to live a life that honors God, then we must take care of our hearts. We must expose our hearts to the right things. Now, I want to be very practical here. I want to be, give us instructions 
and principles that we can live out on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? Now, the heart of a man is too important. What, what the entrance to our heart comes into what we read, what we look at, what we whatever we what we listen to, whatever we give attention to, they are all entrances to our heart, and that's why the Bible says, with all diligence, with all diligence, keep your heart. So my other so my other translation says, guard your heart, watch over the things that are seeking to enter your heart. Now, there's always been distraction in this life. There have always been things that are competing for um, our attention, things that are seeking to enter into our hearts. But more than ever before in the history of humanity, in this generation, we have more distractions than we can ever compare with previous generations, particularly with the advent of social media. Many things seeking our attention, seeking to speak to us, seeking to show us things, and all these things want to end up in our hearts. And we have a major responsibility, a very major responsibility in guarding the gateway to our heart because our heart is the altar of God. Our heart is the direction of our life. Our, li our heart is what defines our existence. Okay, now let's also talk about what fire is because we're talking about the fire not ever having fire on the altar. The fire talks about God's presence, the spirit of God, the life of God. Everyone who is born again, everyone who is a child of God has the nature and the life of God in their hearts. We all have the spirit of God. The Bible says if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you are not one of him. You're not, you're not, you're not part of him. The Bible says that we are the temple of God. The spirit of God lives within us. The Bible talks about God being a consuming fire. God's presence is described as fire. On the day of Pentecost, when um, the Holy Spirit came, the Bible says that there was um, there was cloven tongues, like as a fire, on everyone that received the spirit. So the spirit is likened to fire. So the spirit of God is the fire that is in our hearts. Okay, now our job is to maintain the fire. Our job is to keep the fire burning intensely. And a major fuel to that fire is God's word. That's why in the book of Proverbs that we read, it says, my son, attend to my word. Incline your ears to my saying. You can't, or let me put it this way, how far you go in your work with God, in your carrying out the will of God, is connected to the measure of God's word that you have in your heart. You can never serve God, fulfill God's will above the amount, the measure of his word you allow in your heart. That's why God told Joshua in the book of Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, it says, the book of the Lord should not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. But then you will make your way prosperous prosperous, and then you will have good success. It says that you could say, you will meditate on it day and night, then that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So here is Joshua. He's leading an entire nation. He's meant to be both a head of state and also a war general. He's meant to lead them into battle and also administrate. And God is giving him the primary responsibility. His primary responsibility was to spend time with the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. Keep the word of God, keep his heart filled with the word because that's the only way where you can get God on the scene. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. God and his word are one. If you want to get God on the scene of your life, then his word has to be in your heart. When Jesus was teaching the parable of the sower, he told his disciples that this is about the kingdom. He says the kingdom of God is like this. When they asked him to explain it to them, he said, if you don't know this parable, how can you understand other parables? Because this is the underlining principle by which the kingdom works. How does the kingdom of God work? A person hears God's word, allows creates, allows an atmosphere in his heart where the word of God can grow. And when the word of God um grows and bears fruit that becomes um the harvest 
of the kingdom. The will of God is birthed by men allowing God's word to grow and bear fruit in their hearts. Okay, so Joshua's um, the key to Joshua succeeding or prospering in his assignment was allowing the, the word in his heart until the word can produce, create success. So God was going to make him successful, but God told Joshua, you will make your way prosperous. Why? Because it's Joshua's job to get the word in. And so to everyone out there, men and to the women who love us, our primary assignment is get the word in your heart. If there's going to be fire on the altar, there has to be word within it. The word is life. The life is the fire of God. It's the nature of God and the spirit of God within us. Now, like I said, there are many things competing for attention, many things seeking to challenge God's word in our spirits. Uh, in the parable of the sower, there, 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 there was talk about weeds. Weeds talks about lust of other things, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the distraction of the age, of social media, of news here and there. Some things that are even legitimate, legitimate interest, if we do not measure our interaction with them, they start to compete with the place of God's word in our heart. And when once anything starts to compete with God's word in your heart, it limits the operation or the action of God. It limits your efficiency. It limits your ability. Now, um, I remember Pastor um, Shepherds mentioned this scripture. I'm going to read it from the in the, in the, the Passion Translation. Romans chapter 12, um, verse 11. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. I'm reading from the Passion Translation. It says, be enthusiastic to serve the Lord. King James says, do not be lacking in zeal. Don't be lacking in zeal. He says, yeah, he says, keep in your passion towards him, boiling hot. Keep your passion towards God boiling out, radiate the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with excitement as you serve him. Radiate the glow of the Holy Spirit. Let him fill you with excitement as you serve him. I'm also going to read um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, also from the Passion Translation. Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a spiritual son. Timothy is a leader of a group of churches under him. He's already in ministry, but Paul is giving him a very important instruction here. It's, it's, it's one thing to have a title of a ministry. It's another thing to be operating in the very power of the ministry. He says, I am writing to, I'm reading from verse 6, first, 2 Timothy 1 verse 6, the Passion Translation says, I am writing to encourage you to fan into flame. That's Timothy's responsibility. Fan into a flame and rekindle the fire of the spiritual gate, God imparted to you when I laid my hands upon you. For God will never give for God will never give you the speed of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. So we have a responsibility to keep ourselves on fire. We have a responsibility to be aglow with God. It is our job and role as men, as women, to always be on fire. There, there's, some, there's some statements in scripture that when you look at the frequency that the Bible recommends it, it tells you that this is something you devote your entire being into. For example, a similar scripture is found in um, um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, do not be drunk with wine when it's, in, when it's excess, but be filled with the spirit. The Greek literally says, be continuously filled full of the spirit. We said the spirit is fire. Be always on fire with the spirit. He says speaking in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to God. So it's connecting us to a life of worship, a life of always engaging ourselves in God's presence, because that's where the fire comes in. Now, one of the things you will notice in scripture, in the, in the gospels, and Jesus is our example, is that Jesus was a man who never compromised his time in God's presence. And listen, no matter how busy we are in this day, no matter how important we may think we have um, assignments we think we have in our hands, you can never have an assignment as important as what Jesus had when he was on earth. 
everybody wanted him. Everybody needed his attention. And even beyond what they wanted from him, healing and preaching, he had to put himself in a position to offer himself as the very Lamb of God that took away the sin of all humanity. And he realized that for him to carry out that assignment, that vision, he had to tarry in God's presence. Listen, I'm going to go back to what I mentioned at the beginning when I talked about guard your hearts. For out of it are the issues of life. Your life is determined by what you allow in your heart. And one of the ways you guard your heart is to immerse yourself in God's presence. Because listen, someone, I mean, the statement that goes by the fact that nature abhors a vacuum. If your heart is not immersed in God, it's going to be exposed to many other things. Many other things will gain the foothold and enter your heart and begin to lead your life in a direction that is contrary to God's will. And so Jesus never compromised the presence of God. One of the things that impresses my mind was a statement that said about that was said about him that he woke up a great while before day, and it took the disciples hours looking for him to find him why because no matter how busy he was no matter how much people demanded of him he had to have that time with god the bible says several times that he will withdraw himself into a desert place some other times we hear of him spending the whole night in prayer and one time when he gave the disciples the opportunity of being in his presence while he was praying the bible says that he was transfigured he God before them. He literally was set ablaze until he was radiating the majesty of God's glory. Listen, this is the kind of walk we are called to live. This is the kind of life we are called to live as men. Sometimes in the minds of some men, they they, they program themselves to think that it is a woman's place to spend so much time in prayer, to spend so much time in worship and singing and ministering to God. Listen, look at your Bible and you will see that real men immerse themselves in God's presence. Real men are worshipers. Real men, they sing to God. They sing to God in Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Real men express their love to God. Take a, a look at the life of someone like David. David, the Bible says, was a man after God's heart. David will come before God. See, one of the, there was a time I actually, uh, I was led to look at some key things about David as a man. And I realized that David literally programmed himself to worship. He will make statements like um, in Psalm 103, he will say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And I, I, I remember I was looking at that and I was like, wait a minute here. David is actually giving himself a pep talk. He's actually encouraging himself to worship God. He says, you, my soul, bless God. Because you see, let me tell you something about, about, about being on fire for God. One thing about some of us men is that we can be very impulsive. We, we like to go with the flow. We like to go with how we are feeling. And you don't realize that those feelings are not meant to rule you. When you have them and they are in the right direction, they are the right type of feelings, it's okay to embrace them. But we live our lives with intention, with purpose, and we actually have the responsibility to cultivate the right desires. And sometimes the feelings won't be there. The feeling, the fervor, the fire may not be there. But whether or not you feel, make yourself do it. Talk yourself into it. And so I realized that to get myself into that same place of fervency, of passion, I need to determine within myself that I'm going to stay in the presence of God regardless of how I feel. There will be times when David will say, why are you downcast? Oh, my soul, put your hope in God. Listen, David did not always feel like worship. David did not always feel like prayer, but he will talk himself into it. He will talk himself, he will say things like, I will bless the Lord at all times. My my pra his praise shall continually be in my mouth. When you talk to yourself this way, you start to program yourself, set yourself in that place whereby his presence becomes an addiction until like David, you start to make statements like, as the heart 
pants after the water brook, so my soul longs for you. You make them like, like my heart and my flesh are crying out for the living God. Listen, man, it's your job. You are your primary calling is to be about the presence, is to be about the word, is to immerse yourself in the atmosphere of God's presence. That is how any man can operate in his fullest potential. That is how any man can walk in the fullness of the will and the calling of God. Not only are we called to be on fire, we are also called to spread the fire. We are called to cause the fire of God to spread rapidly amongst men. The Bible says that we are the light of the world. We are to set the world around us on fire. It was said about the apostles that those who have turned the world upside down, they have come here as well. They came and they brought a divine effect in the communities that they were in. Listen, right now, in this season of the earth, in this season, in this nation is a huge opportunity for us. We are not meant to be consumed with the fear and the distraction of the world around us. We're not meant to be caught up with the, with, 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 with the lost, the, the cravings and the distractions of the age. Our hearts are meant to be heavenward. The Bible says, set your heart on things above, not on things on the earth. We are meant to be beholding the glory. And as we behold the glory, we are transformed by the, by the Spirit of God into the same glory that we behold. And then the world is able to behold him in us, in our life. We are meant to be captivated with who God is, with what God is capable of doing. The Bible says, while we look not at the things that are seen but are the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are unseen are eternal. How can you see the unseen? How can you behold the reality of the unseen realm if you don't spend time in this world and spend time in his presence? Listen, there will always be that demand of the flesh. Every man knows what the flesh is. Every man knows what temptation is. Every man knows what it is to be distracted with things that we not like in, the, in our natural self. For example, we like some of us like movies, we like sports, we like interactions with people. And some of those things, they are all legitimate. But we must, those things must never ever challenge the place and the devotion that we give to God. Otherwise, we start to move into the region of idolatry. The Bible talks about things like greed, lust for material things as idolatry. It talks about us putting to death the deeds of the flesh. You see, there are also competing fires to the true fire of God. It was said about um, the children of Aaron in the Old Testament that they offered strange fire in the presence of God. The Bible talks about um, lost that are burning in the hearts of men. And unless we want to fool ourselves, everyone contends with these things. These are things that are competing with our hearts and our affection for God. In fact, people talk about spiritual warfare. And then I realized that in the Bible, the strongest term used to describe conflict obviously is warfare. And the only time warfare is used in the New Testament is when it talks about the lust of the flesh. The Bible will tell us, abstain from fleshly lust that war against your soul. Because these lusts are competing with God, our affection for God. The Bible, James, when he was rebuking some people in, it, so in, in his epistle, he called them adulterers. And adulteresses because of their love for the things of the world, for their friendship, their affection for the things of the world. And so you can't allow such an intense affection for the things of the world that that you, in your heart such that it starts to compete with the place of god's word in your heart you are see there's an immersion an immersion that god is calling us into until the vision that rules our heart is the vision of god is the vision of divine possibilities how can jesus walk in the midst of lack in the midst of need and call forth the provisions of God. Call forth the abundance of God. Many times we just assume, oh, it's because he's Jesus. 
He's a supernatural being and he's able to do things that we normally can't do. Listen, he called us to be an example. He called us to do the same works that he did and even greater. When Peter said he wanted to walk on water, he never rebuked Peter. He actually gave him an invitation and he rebuked him when he fell short. Why? Because it's your destiny. It's your calling to live like Jesus lived, to walk like Jesus walked, to do the very things that Jesus did. But your heart must be in the right place. Your heart must behold the glory and the wonder of God. In that place of God's presence is when visions start to appear. And you have to make time for his presence. You have to fight against every other thing, every other voice, every other demand that, that competes with time with God. Now, let me, let, let me give us a glimpse here into a place where Jesus faced his greatest test but he rose above it to lay hold on God's grace and God's power. Because sometimes we, 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 we are almost full with the sense that Jesus never had any challenges. The Bible says as a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Every kind of test of challenge that we can ever face was thrown at Jesus, but he never buckled up under them. Now, let me read a statement here in the book of um, Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 12, from verse 1, I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible. From verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have, we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter, perfecter, perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says, for the joy that laid before him. That means that his eyes was beholding a joy. For the joy that lay before him, the KJV says, set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, reading this you may be tempted to think that all that Jesus saw was the, was the joy. All that he saw was the glory. But Peter was writing, sorry, um, the writer of Hebrews was writing to people who knew the history of Jesus. And so he could make this statement knowing that they should have a background knowledge of how he came to the place where he was building the joy. Now, I'm going to read Matthew 26 in the King James Version to give you a picture of how did he come from that place get to that place where he was seeing the joy of God and seeing the joy and embraced the cross. Verse 36 of Matthew 26 says, Then commend Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit ye here, yonder, here, here while I go and pray yonder. Verse 37, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And I'm like, okay, sorry. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. But here he's saying in verse 38, my soul is exceeding. He didn't say my soul is sorrowful. He said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. There is so much sorrow that is like death. There's, there's deathly sorrow in an overwhelming measure. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Because he knew the secret. He knew the secret. When his soul was sorrowful unto death, he knew that the secret to his joy, the secret to rising in mastery and in dominion was to stay in the presence. Just tarry ye and watch with me. And then he says, he went a little further and fell on his face, praying, saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he commented to his disciples and finding them asleep and said unto Peter, what could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away the second time and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away and prayed the third time. 
he stayed in the place of prayer and he says the bible says he was saying the same words that is how he moved from that place of excessive overwhelming sorrow until he caught the joy of god there was a script i think in the book of luke it says an angel appeared to him strengthened him when he rose up according to the account of john it says that when they came to arrest him and they said he told them whom do you seek they said jesus of nazareth he said i am he when he said i'm he the bible says they fell backward I believe that was the glory of God overwhelming the people. He was so immersed in God's presence that he shifted from that place of depression, of being overwhelmed with the, with, with the darkness and the death that the enemy was bringing his way. And he rose and began to see the glory of heaven. The Father, he allowed the Father to set him on fire with his will and with his purpose. And this my friends, is where we need to get to. Is we have to be in that place in God's word, in that place in God's presence, that whatever darkness around us, whatever um, evil that is overwhelming the earth, whatever distraction, whatever negativity that is around us cannot get to that place of our heart. The enemy was looking to penetrate his heart, to snuff out the fire of God, to weaken, to limit, to put in bondage. But Jesus refused to allow his heart to be invaded by the enemy. He pressed into the heart of God's will. He pressed into the heart of God's presence until from that presence there arose a glory and he walked into the cross with a mastery, with a sense of dominion. He never felt the need of pity. He never felt overwhelmed. The only time we had him cry was when he gave up the ghost and said, my Lord, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because that was when the presence left him because he took upon himself the sin of humanity. But in his greatest trial, in his when he was facing the greatest challenge, when I believe personally, when all the demons of hell came after him, in the place of God's presence, he found strength. He found a renewed vision and he embraced God's purpose. Listen, every one of us needs to understand the secret of immersing ourselves in this place so that we can see the glory. We can see the wonder of God. Our hearts can be aglow with God's presence because we have an assignment. Every Christian man and every person who is a child of God listening to me right now, we have an assignment. We are the light of the world. Christians are fond of talking about what is wrong with the world. Listen, when you talk about what is wrong with the world, you are indicting yourself because you are the light of the world. And so if the world is plunged into darkness, it's because you're not giving it the light it needs. So get yourself on fire in God's presence. Get yourself on fire with the world. Bible says, do not love the world. Don't be distracted by the world. The voice of the world is loud. The melody of its song is trying to captivate our senses. But the Bible says that if the love of the world consumes your heart, you can't have the love of the Father within you. If the noise of your flesh is loud and you're giving into it, you can't have the passion of the Father within you. Paul said, I put under my body. I bring it into subjection. Someone said, but I don't enjoy the word. I don't enjoy the presence. Listen, make yourself enjoy it. It's an acquired taste. I remember there was a time when, when I first started speaking in tongues a long time ago. I told myself I'm going to pray in tongues for an hour, a day. That was the most challenging thing I ever did in my life up to that moment. I'll, I'll lock myself in the room and I'll pray and I'll check my watch and it's just 15 minutes gone. 15 minutes. And I told myself, I'm going to spend an hour here. But what did I do? I stayed with it. I stayed with it until after a while, and I'm not talking about a few days. After a while, it became comfortable. Later, it became an addiction. 
you can be addicted in God's presence. When David says, my heart, he says, as the heart pants for the water brooks, my soul longs for you. He's talking like an addict. My soul longs. My flesh is craving. We must be men and women that crave God's presence, that are comfortable in God's presence. If you crave the presence of God, if, you, if, you are, if, if the presence of God becomes an addiction, you will not struggle with the lust of the flesh because you will find out it is strange fire. The Bible says, by the Spirit of God, we are able to put to death the misdeeds of the flesh. Timothy was already on assignment for God. He already had responsibility and ministry. But Paul, Paul told him, stir up the gift of God that is within you. Set yourself on fire, for, on fire with God. There are impossibilities in the world. Men are facing impossibilities. It's the Christian, it's the man and the woman of God that is meant who lives, who knows what it is to walk in God's presence, that is meant to take hold of God's power and breathe in possibilities, breathe in the reality of heaven. We are meant to release atmosphere, the atmosphere of heaven on the earth. Jesus said, I'm giving to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Listen, if the heavens are closed, someone is not releasing the keys. Someone is not exercising his responsibilities. I, 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 well, the more I see scriptures like this that talk about us have been having the keys, being the light, the more I realize how much the church needs to awaken to our place and to our role and to our responsibility. We are literally the reason why there is so much darkness in the world. That's it. We are. I, 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 I don't have too much time to be criticizing what the politicians are doing wrong, what the what the people of the world are doing wrong. I'm asking myself the question: How much am I releasing God's agenda on the earth in the place of prayer, in the place of the word, in the place of ever making disciples of men? How much am I carrying in God's presence so that I can reveal? the wonder and the glory of Christ. People are going through the bulk of our challenges, the bulk of our difficulties, the bulk of the struggles we have is that we are trained more in the natural. We have not cultivated an affection for God as we ought to. We are more in tune with the voice of the flesh. We are more caught up with the news of the day. Listen, there's COVID. Everybody knows what's going on. Lockdown. And even when the lockdown is over, there's a mini lockdown in place. And we allow ourselves to let these things get to us, even get to our hearts. Christians are, are holding in their hearts bitterness against politicians, against the system, against what's going on. Listen, we live in a higher realm. We live in a higher plane. We can't be consumed with what consumes the world. We can't be burning with what burns in the world. People are clamoring for this, clamoring for that. Listen, there's okay, it's okay to, con to, to confront injustice in society, but do it from heaven's perspective. Do it with the majesty of God's law. Jesus confronted the issues of his day, but he never held bitterness towards anyone. He never was driven with human emotion or human anger. The Bible says the wrath of man cannot fulfill, cannot bring about the righteousness of God. When he drove people out of the temple, he says, zeal for your house has consumed me. He was consumed with divine zeal. Are we tarrying in the presence of God until it's the zeal, the fire of God that is burning in us? And when it's the fire of God, there's a purity about it. It doesn't drag us down to our basis level. It doesn't drag us down to carnality, or to humanity, it causes us to arise in the strength of God, to arise in the very 
power of God. There's an instruction in the book of um, in um, the book of First Corinthians when Paul was telling them about the gifts of the spirits, about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. The last thing he told them was, "This covet earnestly, earnestly desire the best gifts." And then in First Corinthians chapter fourteen, he begins by saying, "Follow the way of love and desire spiritual gifts." He's telling the saints. Cultivates a yearning, a craving for the expression of God, for the manifestation of God. Don't allow yourself to be so caught up with the things of the world that you are limiting the expression of God within you. People are saying, let's do something, let's do something. Listen, the best thing you can do is to allow, channel all that anger, all that desire, all that craving into God's presence until you take hold of his, of, his, of his presence and release it for the world around you. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts. If I'm so busy craving the things of the world or being agitated with the things that agitate the world, I don't have the emotional energy to connect with God and take hold of his presence and reveal him to the world. And so we must be sanctified in our desires. We must be sanctified in our emotions because that is how the true fire of God comes out. Don't be fervent about things that will keep you from being fervent with the things of God. Don't be so fervent and caught up with the things of the world that you can't even lay hold of God's purpose and agenda in this time, that you can't walk in the fullness of the miraculous, fullness of the manifestation of the spirits, fullness of the grace of God sanctify your desires how with the word and in his presence jesus said sanctify them by your truth your word is truth the word of god is living and active it's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the dividing of the soul and of the spirit and of the joints and marrow it will pierce down it will cleanse it will purify it will remove it will cast down every high thing that exalts itself against knowledge of god there's so many ideas many theories and ideologies competing for attention and people christians get caught up and being distracted with what is being said by this person or that person listen the number one thing that drives us should be the testimony of god's word should be the testimony of his spirit should be God's, the revelation of God's agenda. It is time to walk by faith. It is time to walk in the realm of impossibilities. It is time to be so immersed in God's presence that we hear his voice above the noise of the world, that our hearts are beholding his counsel. He said, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him. Listen, in the midst of greatest darkness, such darkness that even the entire earth was covered with darkness, Jesus was beholding the glory and the joy of God. In the middle of all that, while he was facing the cross, he was beholding the joy of heaven. He was beholding the joy of the resurrection. And it was that joy that saw him through all of the suffering he went through. The world is going to get darker. I'm not a prophet of doom. It's scripture. The Bible says gross darkness shall cover the earth. The Bible says in the last day there will be perilous times. But the saints are in the light. We are in the light. We are in the light and we are to be fascinated, caught up, fixated on the light. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. There used to be an old saying not to be so heavily minded and of no earthly good. But I tell you, that statement has no wisdom in scripture. If you are reason with Christ, if you are seated on the throne with Christ, set your mind on things above. What is above? Above is the glory of God. Above is the eternal victory of the saints. Above is the authority of the saints. Above is the majesty of God. We live on the earth with a vision of God's majesty. And that's one of the things that worship does to us. David will face the darkest trial of his life, but he's busy exalting the majesty of God. He's declaring, the Lord reigns. 
The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. He's declaring, I will exalt you, my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. He is so caught up with who God is, so that when he faces the darkness and the limitations of the earth, when he faces a Goliath, he's not impressed with Goliaths. Why? Because he's too impressed with God to be impressed with earthly things. That is why the prayer of the saints that Jesus gave us begins with worship and ends with worship. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name, your kingdom invading the earth. And then he ends, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. That is how the fire comes in your heart, the altar of your heart. Are you so caught up with him? Are you so fascinated with him, with his goodness, with his generosity? Or are you more fascinated, disturbed, fixated on the injustice of the earth or the, or the dysfunction of the earth? If you are too caught up with the things of the earth, how can you reveal God's will? Jesus was able to change and impact the culture of the day, influence and bring solutions to men. Why? Because he was caught up with who God is. And that is how we walk in the realm of impossibilities. Peter sank when he took his eyes off Jesus. And the church is sinking as long as we are more caught up with what is going on in the world. But when we keep our eyes on him, on his majesty, we start to walk on water. We start to walk in the realm of impossibilities. We start to emerge as we truly are. The, church, the world has not seen the saints. They've not fully seen who we are. They don't know who we are. Because we have not stayed enough in his presence until we reveal him. We've not allowed him to set us ablaze to the point whereby his full glory begin, begins to manifest in us. And I believe, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being negative on the church. I believe that there's coming a time and a generation, and I believe it's this generation, that will reveal God as he ought to be. That will be so caught up with God that no matter how dark the world is, we are so full of joy, radiant with expectation. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. The expectation of the majesty of God. I believe that there's a generation that will be so caught up in their hearts with the expectation of God's glory that they begin to reveal it. But the world, we know what it is to be a son of God. But the world, we know what it is to experience the glorious liberty that we have. But the world, we know that there is a kingdom that rules over our kingdom, a kingdom of light and glory. It all begins with our hearts. There was a time when David lost everything he had in the natural. His loyal men, they spoke of stoning him. But the Bible says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. It's time for us to encourage ourselves in God. It's time for us to see ourselves the way the Father sees us. It's time for us to see ourselves exalted with Christ at the highest place in the heavenlies. Yes, you may have your struggles in the natural. You may have the flesh coming at you. But remember that you are God's righteousness. Remember that the greater one is in you. Remember that no matter how many failures that you have, your name in God's book is still the overcomer. You may have had a thousand failures, but he calls you the overcomer because his presence is fused, is merged with yours. And you are meant to be fixated on his presence. You are meant to be fixated on his strength, unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think or imagine, according to his power that works within us. So we're meant to be caught up with who he is. Our worship takes us there. God, you are the most high. Glorious King, exalted above every other. You made all the earth and the fullness thereof, and nothing is too difficult for you. And you dwell within us, fulfilling your will, carrying out your counsel. When we pray, you answer our prayers with awesome deeds of righteousness. Our prayers make tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. That's how we set our hearts on fire. We can only pray a fervent prayer when we are expectant fervently expectant of the results. Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace. There is something to find in God's presence and that presence is us. We have the keys of the kingdom. We are the light of the world. We are meant to be on fire and the fire that is in our hearts 
will be the, 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 the light that the world sees that draws them to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. I'm just going to end with a word of prayer. I'm going to pray for every single person here. That Father God, this message that I preached, I pray that it continues to resound. Every message that has been preached here today, not just my message that has been preached, let it continue to resound in every heart. Let it continue to resound above the noise of the flesh, above the noise of the enemy, above the noise of the world. Let this message continue to resound and let it move us to the place in your presence where all we see is your glory, where all we see is your victory, where all we see is your provision, your purpose and counsel being fulfilled. And then we're able to leave out the reality of it in our world in the name of Jesus. Amen.